Good evening, church. Would you stand with us tonight as we begin to worship? Psalm 92 says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, and at the work of your hands I sing for joy. Church, would you sing with us tonight as we worship our risen Savior? We sing there's a love that we've come to know. And there's a love we have come to know. A Savior. A Savior who won't let go. Yes. Our hope, our hope, our hope is you. Oh, oh, Jesus, Jesus, your name be lifted high. Savior, Savior, you make us alive. It is finished, finished from now for all of time. Oh, Jesus. Jesus forever glorified. And there's a day that's coming. There's a day that is coming soon. When the bride will have her groom. I'm not the washerman. Your name. 
Cry.
Let's pray as we uh, are about to give. Father, we come to you with hearts that are so grateful, Lord, because of the many things that we have uh, to be thankful for. Father, we're thankful for First Baptist and the wonderful things that you are doing in the life of our church, even, uh, even in a day like today where our big things are happening uh, for our future, Lord. Father, we're so thankful for uh, the opportunity that we have to give, Lord, because it represents the fact that we have a heavenly Father who cares for us, a heavenly Father who provides for us and meets our needs, Lord. And so as we give, we pray that our hearts would be uh, full of joy and thanksgiving as we give to this church to accomplish your work. Father, we are so thankful for the blood of Jesus. And Father, I know that this week, is a week full of gratitude for so many people, but at the same time, it's a week uh, that's hard for so many people, Lord, as we remember the loss of loved ones. And so, Father, we pray that even in the midst of that, that you would bring comfort, even in the midst of that, that you would fix our eyes on Jesus this week, and that our hearts would be full of joy and thanksgiving, and we pray it in the name of Christ, amen. Yeah. 
Good evening. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verses 20 to 24. This is the last night on our uh, Sunday evening series for this fall on grace. We've been, we've called it Unwrapping Grace. Uh, we've talked about the fact that grace is a multifaceted thing that Christians often take for granted. We talk about it like we know what we're talking about. We talk about it like it's a simple thing, but I hope you've seen something of the fact that it's actually a really complicated thing. And there are a number of ways that grace shows up in the Bible and explodes with relevance in all different ways directions. The working definition for grace that we have used over these months is that grace is all the undeserved gifts that God gives for our good and His glory. They're undeserved gifts. There is nothing that we can work for or earn. They are for our good. They're a blessing and a benefit to us, and they are for God's glory. They make Him look awesome. And the reason that this has been a series of sermons and not just one sermon is because that first word in the definition, that it's all of the undeserved gifts. God gives us all sorts of things when he gives us his grace. We talked about the fact that all grace stems from the throne of grace where Jesus is seated. And over the weeks, we've talked about forgiving grace and transforming grace and comforting grace and empowering grace. We've talked about ministering grace and all sorts of grace. Last week, we talked about common grace, as theologians call it, and the fact that God is kind and gives blessings to everyone alive, whether or not they trust in Jesus. He blesses them through Jesus, even if they reject Jesus. It's a gift that goes to the whole world. Tonight, we're going to come back to a special kind of grace that God gives to his people who have trusted in Jesus. I'm calling it pleading grace. I'm calling it the kind of grace where we beg for things, where we ask God to give us things. We experience life as needy individuals and we fall on our face and we ask him for blessings. We ask him for gifts and he gives those gifts to us in his grace. I'm calling it pleading grace and our text for this evening is Mark chapter 11 verses 20 to 24 and this is what God says. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, in so many ways, I have been burdened to say some of the things that I am going to say tonight to your people at First Baptist since the summer of 2017. I pray that as we try to organize our thinking and our desires and our requests around your word and around your grace, I pray, pray that the power of Jesus Christ would be displayed in this room. I pray that your grace from your heavenly throne would press into our 
hearts. I pray that whatever else you're doing in this season of transition at First Baptist, that you would be forging your people into those who are bold to request big things. I pray that you would make us a people of prayer. I pray that you would make us a people who trust in your love for us. And Father, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most important lessons I ever learned about prayer was on a tour bus on the way to Florida to do ministry. I was a young college student. I don't remember exactly what grade I was in, but I was a young college student. Uh, I was a Bible student. Uh, I had made the decision at that point that I would pursue a call into ministry. And the people at my home church asked if I would be involved in leadership for a youth trip to Florida to do some ministry work and some, uh, uh, some discipleship down here. And so I agreed to do it on a summer uh, home from school. And the day came to leave for the trip and all of the students and those of us in the leadership, we loaded up on this uh, big expensive tour bus in Kentucky and we uh, started driving down here. And somewhere along the way, uh, we got to a stretch of road where there was nothing, nothing happening, nothing going on, nobody in sight. And all of a sudden, the bus began to sputter to a stop. And we pulled off on the side of the road. It was the summertime. It was hot. We'd been in the road for a, on the road for a long time. I believe we were maybe in Georgia we had deadlines to keep. We've got a bus load full of high school students who you would never want to read a book that they would write about patience. <laughs> and as we pull off the side of the road into the grass, everybody is really concerned about what this is going to mean, about the schedule, the timing to get to where we needed to be, the heat on the bus. And the bus driver got off and was messing around outside, and we found out over the course of the trip that he was a Christian, and he came back on the bus and he said, guys, we have a big problem, and if anybody is inclined to pray, you need to do it right now. And so some of the other more senior leaders hopped up and they were going to go off the bus to figure out what was going on. And one of the pastors said, uh, hey, Heath, would you stand up and lead everybody in a prayer? And so I said, okay. So I, I walked up to the front and I grabbed that little uh, walkie-talkie thing that puts you on the loudspeaker of the bus. And I don't remember exactly what I prayed, but I remember being nervous as I went up to pray. Not because I was asked to pray, but because I knew what I was being asked to pray. I was being asked to pray a specific prayer that this bus would start working. Uh, and I didn't know uh, if the bus was going to start working. And I was concerned about praying a prayer in front of all of these young students that God would make the bus work what they would think if God decided not to make the bus work. So I want God to make the bus work, and I'm not afraid to ask him, but I don't know what these guys are going to think if I ask him in front of them, and then he doesn't answer, and what then? <laughs> so I prayed a very long prayer that went something like this. God, we just are thankful for everything that your hand gives us and right now you want us to be on the side of the road and we don't know what you want to happen from this point on. We'd like the bus to get fixed, but we don't know what you want. And so whatever you do, I want to ask that you would take care of us. I want to ask that you'd watch over us. I want to ask that you'd be patient with us. And on and on and on and on and on and the sun and the moon and the stars and Amen. I didn't even know what had happened 
by the time I said amen. I just knew I'd been going on for a very, very, very long time, afraid, though I hate to admit it, to pray anything specific and particular. I prayed a long and a weak prayer. And I think I prayed a long and a weak prayer in nervousness because I did not fully understand a passage like Mark chapter 11, verses 20 to 24, where the gift of pleading grace is exposed to us. The command to beg and plead with God for big things is laid out to the disciples of Jesus Christ. Make no mistake about it, Jesus describes a gift of God's grace here. The word grace isn't used, but the language of gift is used. Remember, grace is all the undeserved gifts that God gives for our good and his glory. We see the language of gift here in verse 23. Jesus says, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. It's the language of grant. It's the language of gift. Whenever you see the language of gift or grant in the Bible, it's the language of grace because grace is God's gifts. We also see that it's a grace in verse 24. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted to you. So there's the language of grant again, but there's also the language of receiving. When we ask for things as the people of God bought with the blood of Jesus, he is pleased to give us those things as a manifestation of his grace. That's the gift of pleading grace. And it's an undeserved gift. There's no good thing that you would ever plead for, that you'd ever beg for, that you'd ever ask for, that you deserve. You have nothing coming to you. So it's not about, well, let me ask for the thing that I really deserve. Let me ask for the thing that I have really earned. The idea is to ask for the thing that you want or to the th for the thing that you need and not worry about whether you deserve it. You already don't. But to trust that when you ask for those things, you'll get them as a gift. The Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle James says in James chapter 4 verse 2 that you don't have because you don't ask. That's incredible. You don't have because you don't ask. The half-brother of Jesus Christ writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and says, there are things that would be yours, but they are not yours, and the reason they are not yours is because you haven't asked for them yet. Why don't you have? Because you haven't asked. You haven't pled with God for the thing. You don't have his grace responding to your prayer because you haven't prayed for the thing yet. So we need to talk about the gift of pleading grace. And to understand this gift, we need to understand what the goal is. What is the goal of this thing that I'm calling pleading grace where we beg and ask God for things? Well, the goal of this, the goal of prayer when you ask for things that you don't have and that you want or that you don't have and that you need, the goal is to make you understand your dependence. It's to make you understand how reliant you are on God. It's to make you feel the weight of all the things you don't have and the things that you get are things that you get from God and not from your own doing. There is, in this exercise in dependence, an element of trust. We see this in the text. Mark 11, starting in verse 20, as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. 
And Jesus answered, saying to them, have faith in God. So just to get a little bit of the context here, a little bit earlier in Mark chapter 11, long about verse 14, uh, Jesus sees this fig tree off in the distance, and he goes up to it wondering if there's any figs on it. And what you find out is there are no figs on the tree because it's not the season for figs. And Jesus, overheard by some of the disciples, says, may no one ever eat from you again. Jesus curses the fig tree because even though it wasn't the season for figs, the fig tree which had been made by the Son of God was not ready to serve the Son of God when he appeared. And so he got cursed, the fig tree did. Well, the disciples overhear this And a little bit later, as they're walking along, they see the fig tree that Jesus had cursed. And Peter says, hey, Jesus, uh, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. You know that they were shocked. I think something like what happened was the guys are near the leader, Jesus, and they hear him say, may no one ever eat from you again. And they probably said something like, well, there he goes again. King of kings, Lord of lords, getting after a fig tree. It's not even the season for fig trees. Now he's nobody, may nobody ever eat from you again. And my goodness, that's a weird thing to say. What in the world's he doing? And then a little bit later, they see a withered fig tree. And there is shock that the fig tree withered at the command of Jesus. And the reason we know there is shock is because when Peter points it out. Jesus says, have faith in God. Jesus identifies in this statement from them shock and unbelief. It's as though he's saying, "Uh, guys, I cursed the fig tree. I'm the son of God. I said, may no one ever eat from you again. What did you think was going to happen to the fig tree, Peter? (laughs) Did you think fig trees were going to produce from it again? Did you think all kinds of people were going to eat from it? Why are you surprised that the fig tree that I I caused to wither is withered? He sees a trust problem. And then he teaches us about prayer. He says, have faith in God. Verse 23, truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it'll be granted him. He's saying, hey, you've got to trust God. And that's not just when I say something about a fig tree, that's when you say something about a mountain. There is an element of trust here. He is saying that if this prayer thing is going to work, if your requests are going to work, then you have to believe it. You have to believe that God is going to display his power. And if you don't believe in a display of the power of God, then you don't trust him. And the exercise in prayerful dependence isn't going to work. So there's an element of trust here, but there's also an element of love. Remember, the goal of pleading grace, the goal of prayer that asks, is to create dependence. And if we're going to have the right kind of dependence, then we have to trust that God can do these things and not doubt. But we also have to love him. Look at the language of relationship here in verse 24. He says, I say to you, All things for which you pray and ask, believe that you've received them and they'll be granted to you. Do you see the relationship there? Do you see give and take? You have a need, you have a concern, you have a desire, and you go to God. And you say, God, I need this, I need that. I need the utility bill paid this week. I need the bus to start working on the road here. I need my wife to get better. 
You have the need, you take it to God, you tell him what it is, and he responds and gives it to you. There is a give and a take. There is a relationship here. God, through his son Jesus Christ, is summoning us into a relationship with God. He's teaching us dependence in a relationship where there must be trust, in a relationship where there must be a loving give and take. The nature of pleading grace, where we beg God for the things we need and want, is to make us dependent. That's the goal. Pleading grace is not about giving us independent power. It's not about hooking us up with our own independent power so that we can make life happen for us. One of the last jobs I had before I got into ministry was uh, working as a temp. So I worked for this temp agency and I would get assigned all over these places around town. And one of the goals that I had is that every job I had, I was going to try to share the gospel with somebody at that job. And uh, one of the lengthiest jobs I had at the temp agency was filling in at a bank, uh, a bank data processing center. And uh, on my lunch break, I was always taking my lunch break with the same group of people. And one of the people on break with me was a witch. (laughs) I didn't expect that reaction. But no, a real witch. Now, maybe you're laughing because we just got out of Halloween. I'm not talking about like a fake witch with like a black pointy hat and like a long crooked. I'm talking about like a member of the Wiccan religion, like an actual witch, like power of darkness stuff. And I said, I'm going to talk with this person about Jesus. And I was expecting tough sledding in the conversation. So I started talking about how I was a Christian and how Jesus died on the cross for our sins. You're a Christian. You're just like me, said the witch. (laughs) You are just like me because Christians and witches believe the same thing. And I said, well, so I'm totally thrown off my game here. Uh, This is not where I thought this was going to go. I I said, well, uh, how's that? (laughs) And he said, witches cast spells and Christians pray. So just like we cast spells to make things happen, you call it prayer, but it's the same thing, is what the person said. And so we had to have a long conversation about that, and I think by the end of the conversation, neither one of us believed that we'd gotten very far with the other one. But the point is, here's the thing, though you gasp and chuckle about that, I think a lot of Christians treat prayer just like that. Like it's our personal power. Like it's our personal initiative that just like a witch casts a spell, I have my own power and it's called prayer. But that's not the way this works. The goal of pleading grace is to make us dependent, not to give us our own independent power. It's not about us. It's not about our own comfort and power and glory. God uses prayer to strengthen our relationship with him, not weaken it. This is important because when we hear Jesus say, hey, say to the mountain, move from here to there, it'll be moved. Whatever you ask, God will give it to you. A lot of you have stories where you've done that and you didn't get it and you wonder about what Jesus is saying here. And one of the the things that will help you is if you understand that this is not about your own independent power, but that God uses prayer to strengthen your relationship with him, not weaken it. And so here's what this means. He will never answer a prayer that gratifies your lusts. He won't do it. Because this whole thing is about dependence. It's about trusting him and having faith in him and having a loving relationship with him. In James chapter 4 verse 2, which I quoted at the beginning, it says, you don't have because you don't ask. Verse 3 says, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. 
Jesus is trying to make you dependent, not independent. And so if you're asking for things in business for yourself, then don't be surprised when the mountain doesn't move. God uses prayer to include us in accomplishing his will, not thwarting it, is another thing that'll help you. If you got a story of a mountain that didn't move when you ask, it's highly likely that you got crosswise with this reality. God, use us, God uses prayer to include us in accomplishing his will, never in thwarting it. And so he will never answer a prayer that is ultimately bad for us and against his will. Again, the goal of pleading grace is about dependence, not independence, not you ruling the universe. King David had a desire to build a house for God. And his son, Solomon, pointed out in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 17, that David's good heart was to exalt God in building a house for him. And he asked God for that very grace. And God said, no. Your heart's good. Thank you. But you're not the one who's going to build the temple. It's going to be your son. David asked God for a big thing, but God had a better idea, and he would be a bad God if he let us do anything we wanted instead of using our prayers to accomplish his plan. And so the way this works, since prayer is about making us dependent, since it's about trust and love, if you find yourself asking God to move a mountain, and the mountain doesn't move. And your instinct is to doubt God instead of your own motives. And your instinct is to doubt God instead of your own wisdom. Then you need to grow in the kind of trust and love that prayer is all about anyway. The goal of pleading grace is to make us dependent. But finally, let's look at the guarantee of pleading grace. And this is where all the action is in the text here. A remarkable reality flows out of this relationship of love and trust. When you go to God with pure motives in keeping with his will, and you want to ask him for big things, Jesus says, you, you, little old you and little old me, we have access to the power of heaven, is what Jesus says. And Jesus makes to us, make no mistake, a promise that you can move mountains. In Mark chapter 11, verse 23, listen to this. You've heard this before, but you've got to let this grab you. Truly, I say to you, this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who never says anything untrue. says, truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Now, some people make a big to-do out of this, that this is a metaphorical statement. And it certainly is a metaphorical statement. I mean, you haven't seen throughout the history of the church a lot of mountains moving around all over the place. But you can't miss the promise behind the metaphor. And the promise behind the metaphor shows up in verse 24. I say to you, all things, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them. And they will be granted you. Jesus is making a promise to you and to me to beg and plead for big things. And he says, when you ask, you'll have them. I've heard sermons on this text where the whole sermon is about all the things it can't mean. And the preacher never gets to the promise of Jesus Christ that if there's a mountain in your way and you ask for it to be moved, Jesus Christ gives a guarantee that it'll be moved. 
If there's something you need, if there's something you want, and you ask God for it, Jesus promises that it'll be yours. Jesus did not command us to pray mountain-moving prayers because he wanted us to pray small little prayers. Jesus commands the prayer of mountain-moving prayers because he wants to encourage us to pray big, bold prayers. He's asking us to identify the mountains in our life and go to God in a spirit of trust and in a spirit of love and say, God, move the mountain. God, there's this thing I need. And if you don't give it to me, I won't have it. And so give it. The reason Jesus says these words is to embolden us to pray prayers like that. We, uh, we have to be really careful after we remember not to abuse this promise. We have to remember that this is a promise that is encouraging us to pray bold prayers. Just one illustration from Scripture. In Joshua chapter 10. Joshua has gotten word from the Gibeonites who had deceived the Israelites into a, uh, into a false treaty of protection. Joshua gets word from the Gibeonites that they are being attacked by a consortium of kings led by Adonai Zedek. And uh, Adonai Zedek has all these guys coming after them, and it looks bad for the Gibeonites. And they get word to Joshua, and Joshua musters an army, and he heads down to Jerusalem. And he gets down there, and the attack starts. And the Israelites are winning against this coalition of forces led by Adonai Zedek. And as that coalition starts to realize that they're getting thumped, they turn and they run. And the Israelites give chase. And as they are following them and killing them as they run, God, the Bible says, throws down hailstones out of the heavens and begins killing this coalition of an enemy force. The Bible says that more people were killed from the hailstones out of the sky than from the sword of the Israelites. The army is being routed by God's people. And in Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 to 15, the Bible says, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jashar? So this isn't just some group of Bible thumpers that told the story. There's another source out there that said, hey, yeah, guys, guess what? The sun stood still. It's in the book of Jashar. And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. There was no day like it. That before it or after it, when the Lord listened to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel... And then Joshua and all Israel with him returned to the camp to Gilgal. Now, one thing, just to say really quickly, I don't know who you are and how that grabs you, but there might be people in here who are going, uh, does he, that guy up there, uh, I didn't catch his name, does he think that the sun stood still? Uh, is this one of those churches where they believe that, um, like the Bible? So some of you might be texting the person who brought you, does he really believe that the sun stood still? And the answer is yes. Yes, we believe that the sun stood still. Um, and if that is a problem, and I can understand how it, so how it sounds strange, uh, here, is, here is the part that begins to make it understandable. We believe that God made the heavens and the earth by the power of his word, and we believe that the God who made this natural order uh, by his power is more than competent to interrupt it with his power. And so, yes, 
the sun stood still. But after we get over that, think about, <laughs> think about what a crazy prayer this is for Joshua. All right, they're already winning. The enemies are already running away. Hail stones are falling out of the sky and pelting the enemies in front of them. And the Israelites continue to give chase and continue to stab them. Now, think of all the prayers that Joshua could have prayed that would have made more sense. First of all, he could have prayed, God, thanks for this much of a victory, and now could we have a rest? He could have prayed that. There wasn't anything stopping him from that. God, it's been a long, hard day. We've killed a lot of people. You've killed a lot of people. Thank you, and let's take a break. He could have prayed that. Uh, he could have prayed, if you're not in the mood for a break, he could have prayed something a little more reasonable than, uh, than what he actually did pray. He could have prayed, God, help us to run faster than these people. God, help them to run slower than we do. God, could you make them trip on the hailstones? All these things that could have been more reasonable, but Joshua, the leader of God's people, called out to God in the hearing of the people, and his bold, crazy idea is, God, make the sun stop. Make the sun, extend the day so that the sun freezes where it is and we have more daylight to kill people. That's what he prayed. He asked, I mean, if there was ever a mountain that you were asking for to be moved, if, if there was ever a more, if you'll pardon my saying so, a more unreasonable prayer request, this was it. God, stop the sun. But the Bible says, in response to that prayer of Joshua, and the sun stood still. Jesus' words are not recorded for us. And that prayer and its response is not recorded for us in the Bible so that we will think that God does not answer prayer. The whole reason it's there is to put outlandish examples of frozen suns and mountains moving so that we will be bold to plead with God for things more than anything tonight. I want you to be motivated to beg God for the big things in your life, for the mountains that need to be moved. More even than that is I want us to be motivated to beg and plead with God himself to move the mountains that are in front of our church right now. I count from where I stand right now five big mountains that need to be moved. And what I have been praying over the months and the years, again, as I said, this, this has been in my heart to talk with you about since, honestly, the summer of 2017. But where we are right now today, looking at the future, trusting in the power of God, the relationship between the sermon this morning and the sermon tonight is all of that power of God. God allows us to be caught up in it as we participate in what he is doing in our prayers. And I want to ask you, I want to plead with you to join with me in pleading with God to move five big mountains in our congregation right now. And here they are very quickly. We need God to move the mountain of spiritual revival in our church. I'm not talking about Jacksonville yet. I'll get there. But we need God to move the mountain of spiritual revival in our church. And here's the thing. I don't want you to hear me say that and hear me attacking you or hitting you over the head. Listen. I say it every week. I love this church. One of the reasons I love this church, and there's no place I'd rather be, is because I don't know a better, bigger group of people more committed to Jesus and the Bible than this church is. And I know you are growing in your faith. Here's what I'm saying. Don't you want more? Don't you want more? Whatever you have of Jesus, don't you want more of it? Whatever commitment you have to the Word of God, don't you want more? Don't you feel sick to your stomach? I do at the thought of being 
frozen and placid in your spiritual growth? Don't you want more of Jesus? My prayer every day is that ever how much of Jesus that God can shove into my small, sinful heart, I want him to shove that much into it. Whatever will fit, squeeze it in, Lord. Isn't that what you want? I am begging and pleading with God, and I want you to join me, that, that we would grow in our love and our passion for Jesus in the Bible. A second mountain is an outpouring of faith in Jacksonville. Another thing I pray every day is, God, would you make the future days at First Baptist better than the former days? Listen, that's a mountain-moving prayer. We used to have a 1,000 people baptized a year in this church. What kind of crazy thing is God going to have to do in a culture that hates God and hates Christianity to do better than that? That's a crazy thing. But the God who can make the sun stand still and the Christ who says, ask to move mountains, I say, why not ask God to save a whole city? He's done it before. He saved Nineveh. Before the United States was a so-called Christian country, it was not a Christian country. And it got that way because faithful Christians shared the gospel. Before Christianity had spread out all over the world the way it has now, there were 12 guys locked in a room thinking Jesus was dead. I mean, it's actually been darker days than this before in the history of the church. And Jesus Christ has proven he knows how to run this whole thing. And so Jesus knew how to save people 2,000 years ago. He knew how to save people 200 years ago. He knew how to save people in 1960 and 1970 and 1980. And don't you know Jesus knows how to save people in 2020? Don't you know that? And so if Jesus has the power to save people today like he always has, let's just beg God, save everybody. Who do you want to leave out? Who gets left out? Save everybody except those people over there in Arlington. You want to leave them out? We don't want to leave anybody out. God, save everybody. Save a whole city. And don't do it without us. Third mountain is wisdom for me and the other leaders in our church. That's staff and lay leadership. There's so many big, expensive things happening in our church right now. So many overwhelming things. So many needles that have to get threaded. I hope you don't think I am smart enough on my own to figure all this out and do all this. If God doesn't give me wisdom, if God doesn't give the other leaders in our church wisdom, it's over. Wisdom for the leadership and flexibility for you. It's going to be so easy over the next 18 to 24 months to everybody to get on their hobby horse of unanswered questions and favorite things that aren't the same and things that are moving that they want to stay still. And if everybody in here decides they're going to die on their own personal hill, we're over. And so, God, here's a mountain. Would you move it? Would you make everybody flexible? Would you create a spirit of trust in our congregation, a spirit of love? in our congregation, a spirit of deference where it doesn't have to be my way. God, there's a mountain, move it. Fourth mountain is this, all this movement, all this relocation needs to happen on time and on budget. And there isn't anybody who has the power to make that happen except God himself. If you've ever built a $150,000 house, you know how hard it is to end on time and on budget. It's a $30 million deal. The only person who has the power to make that happen is God. God, there's a mountain. Would you move it? And then selling land quickly and fruitfully. One of the things I mean there is we need a lot of money. We need a lot of money. Uh, a $30 million plan actually costs $30 million. That's money that you have to give or we have to generate through the sale of land. I said this morning about uh, there are stories about each of those properties that demonstrate the power of God. Just one of them, the Hilliard property, we were told that that's going to be the hardest piece of property to sell. It's going to be on the market for two years. Downtown will all be over and done with and you're still going to have Hilliard on the market just because of the nature of the market. And... Um, We've been praying that that wouldn't be true. We've been praying that God would 
take care of it quickly, that God would give us a good price for it. And what God did was instead of a two-year deal, it was a two-month deal. That's the power of God. And that's not the power of God abstracted from you and me. That's the power of God in response to prayer. We ask God to move a mountain. He moved a mountain. And we got other mountains that need to be moved. Those are five mountains that I count that need to be moved. And I'm asking you to join me in pleading with God to move them. I'm asking you to plead with God to move the mountains in your own individual life. The most significant mountain is the mountain between you and eternity. It's the mountain of sin that separates you from a loving, holy God. And because of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, whenever you repent of your sins and trust in him and say, God, forgive me, he will. There's nothing more impossible than that. That makes a $30 million construction project a cakewalk. God forgives your sin and forgives it forever because of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus whenever you trust in him. I told you about my prayer on the bus. Long, winded, weak prayer, asking for nothing in particular, just a prayer prayed in fear that I was going to lead these young people astray. And I said, amen. And another person on the bus stood up and grabbed that thing out of my hand. And he said, and God, would you please fix the bus? And do you know what happened? I'm not making this up. <laughs> the bus fired. I mean, in a second, the bus fired up. I was like, <laughs> I look like an idiot, but God looks awesome. And so does this guy who prayed. I mean, God, we just want to trust you and we want to be careful and we don't know what you want, but we sure don't want to be here. And so whatever. And he goes, and God fixed the bus and the thing turned over. Listen, there's a lesson in that. Just like there is a lesson in these words from Jesus. One of the reasons God puts mountains in our life is so that he'll move them when we ask him to. So here's what I want to do. I want to end just a little bit differently tonight. This is our last one in the Grace series. And this is a really important moment for me. I don't know if it feels as important to you as it does to me, but I've said to you, like, part of me doesn't even care what happens over the next 18 to 24 months if God would grow in us a new passion for his glory and his grace and if we would be a praying people. And so here's what I'm going to do. We're going to do this just a little bit differently tonight. I'm going to go down here and I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask as many of you that want to, to join me in praying for these mountains and others. You come on, come on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start walking over here too. Don't make me be down here by myself. And if the Bible says, ask God to move a mountain and it'll be moved, then let's just ask him to do it. Let's, let's hold him to his word and ask him to do what only he can do, and let's ask him together. And I'm going to ask for these things in the life of our church, and I'm also going to give you an opportunity to ask for this in your life as well. And so if you've got the opportunity to put a hand on somebody or to grab somebody else's hand, let's just do what Jesus tells us to do. There's mountains, and Jesus knows how to move them, so let's pray. Father, I pray first of all, in Jesus' name, that if there is anyone in this room who has never repented of their sins and trusted in Jesus, that they would come to you right now and ask you to move the mountain of sin from their life. I pray that right now they would confess their sin and ask for Jesus Christ's forgiveness. 
And I pray that you'd give them the gift of faith. I pray they'd pray it right now. Father, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ in this room. Father, there's so much care and trouble in this room. So many things going on that we don't know. So many mountains that need to be moved. Father, I pray that right now we would each come to you with our mountains and ask you to move them. Father, there are some people with financial mountains. Move them. Father, there are some people with relational and marriage mountains. Move them. Father, there are people in this room with mountains in the lives of their children. They've fallen away from Christ. They're living in sin. Father, I'll bet there is no heartbreak in this room like the heartbreak of a child who has wandered away from Jesus. Father, move the mountain. Father, there are people here with job mountains. They're overwhelmed with a problem at work. Move the mountain. There are people here with sin mountains. They are overwhelmed with a pattern of deceit, a pattern of sexual sin, a pattern of anger, a pattern of sinful sorrow. You command them to be happy. And in spite of that, they are sad for no good reason. It's a mountain and they need it moved. Move it. And Father, we want to come before you as a family, a body of believers that you have brought to this point in our history not to end our story, but to continue it. And there are mountains that you need to move. Father, I pray for spiritual revival in our church. I pray that you would cause us to grow in our love for the word. That you cause us to grow in our love for Jesus. That you cause us to grow in our love for one another. Father, I know there are people in our congregation who are angry, who are embittered, who are frustrated. There are people who are angry and embittered and frustrated maybe with you, maybe with one another, maybe with me. It's a mountain, Father. Move it. Father, I wanna pray that everything we do would be about the salvation of a city. You are the God who holds salvation in your hand. You are the God who loves Jacksonville more than we do. We have no idea how to save a city. It's a mountain. Move it. Put faith in the heart of every person in this city and motivate us to do it. Move this mountain, Jesus, please. Father, You raise up leaders and you take them down and you equip them with what they need. And I'll just be the first to say that First Baptist Church needs wise leadership. There's no room for foolhardiness or for weakness or for lack of courage. So God, for me and everybody else involved in leadership in this church, give us wisdom and strength to do the right thing. I don't have it. I'm confessing in front of my brothers and sisters. I don't have it. 
So move this mountain. And Father, for the flexibility that we all need. I heard questions even today about people concerned about what might be different. And it's going to be different. And people are going to freak out unless you help us. It's a mountain, Father. Would you move it? And Father, the timing and the budget. Nobody's in control of a project this complicated. Nobody's in control of a project this expensive. But Father, you are. We see a mountain. Would you move it? And Father, we need money. We need money. We need tens of millions of dollars. And a combination of loans and generous people and the sale of land. And Father, other ways I'll bet that you've thought of that we haven't. It's a mountain, Father. Would you move it? Father, we pray not to be presumptuous, not because we deserve anything, but because Jesus commanded it. And so the Son of God who made us and saved us, when he says to bring our mountains to you and ask them to be moved, we just do it in obedience. We don't know what else to do. And so, Father, in our lives and in this church, Would you move our mountains, grow our faith, grow our love, exalt Jesus Christ and make the future days better than the former. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.